Hot wagons incoming. VW Golf R wagon, Subaru WRX sports wagon, Genesis G70 shooting great, BMW M3 touring, and maybe a Toyota GR Corolla wagon. Yes, it's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode number 208, Hypo Wagons Ho! Um, I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and joining me in looking at these upcoming fast and fabulous load haulers are senior journalist Richard. Aloha. And key contributor Steve. Good and hard. We'll also look at the fresh metal we've been driving this week and dive into your feedback. YouTubers, if you want to plot your own adventure, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's circle the wagons. Um, this is from a story authored during the week by Tony O'Kane, who's recently joined our roster of, of fantastic freelance uh, contributors. Um, and now he says, what was once the drab, dreary and undesirable wagon uh, might be in the midst of an epic transformation. Um, that's because Carmaker is waking up to the fact that some customers might want practicality of an SUV um, with that higher ride height, but um, are after, uh, and often they have these compromised dynamics. So what's better than a wagon? A fast wagon. And he's done a bit of a roundup on, on what's with us now and what's coming shortly. So let's talk through each of the, the options that he's landed on and uh, talk through what we make of them, pros and cons, and so on. So the, the first one that he's mentioned is Subaru WRX Sport Wagon, and he calls out the fact that the last time we saw a fair income WRX wagon was back in 2007, and we're going to have one of sorts in that it, uh, it will revive the WRX uh, Sport Wagon. I want to say next year it's due to come here. Steve, have you heard anything on timing for the car i'm just looking through my notes um, i don't remember the i don't remember them detailing an exact time for it i think it was okay. more sort of one of those quarters or halves sort of thing i mean i yes. think we'll get it uh i would think the ah, sedan next, is going to arrive first yes he said next year he said subaru next year so 2022 will revive the wx sports wagon. you would think something like maybe the sedan comes sometime in the first half and the wagon you know yep. a few months after that yep and he's I mean, saying it's, it, it's really, it's almost a rebadged new generation Lavor. Well, do, yeah. you know, uh, do you want to know a secret? Yeah. So when is I was, it related to Subaru's return or is it just something? <laughs> just a general secret. Oh, so about, about Subaru. About Subaru. Subaru. Right. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I can tell you Subaru's secret as well. Great, okay. great. Go for it. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was getting off an aeroplane. And um, it's been a long time since I've got off an aeroplane. And as I was walking an down an aeroplane, yeah. they fly through the air and you suck a tube. Oh, yep. okay. Yeah, um, cool, cool. I think I vaguely was, remember those. I was walking to the baggage carousel with uh, one of the big bosses of Subaru. And I said to him, so why didn't you just call the Lavorg the WRX wagon? Yep. And he said to me, because we didn't know if it would work or not. Oh. And if it does work, we will. And I wasn't able to tell you. Really? Fine. Hmm. That's interesting. So that makes go. perfect sense then, doesn't yep. it? So they wanted to quarantine any failure yeah. from the WRX bag. Totally. Oh, so be that was the plan. Because the Lavorg, to be honest, was not great. No. So it, right. had that, it was CVT only, which was... That's right. Yeah, it didn't yeah. have the full fat engine, you know, they, so yeah. it was... They it should was have bit... called it the Laverne. Yeah. <laughs> it should be the, the Subaru Laverne. <laughs> yeah. Well, this one, yeah. this yeah. one, you know, will be uh, pretty much the full fat job. 2.4 mm. litre turbo. And it's the flat four, of course. Yeah. Um, 202 kilowatts for this market, 349 newton metres. Um, but it and is CVT it, it, only, it, though. CVT only. That's a, mm. that's a drawback. I, I've got to say, I think I'm with uh, yeah. a lot of people in not loving the CVT and particularly when, when, in a performance car. When, when, when is Subaru just going to get rid of it? Yeah. And Toyota. I mean... Because it's about the only ones left using it, right? I mean, that's right. Yeah. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but it just... Uh, yeah. it just well, it, it's, it, I was thinking about it having driven, um, what was it, the Outback recently. Hmm. And in trying to chase, consistently chase that sweet spot between performance yeah. and economy, you get that disconnect between your road speed and the engine speed. And that's what feels so weird. You know, totally. that's where you get that droniness. And to me, it feels like a slipping clutch. It is. Or it like, sounds like it, you know, that you, 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 your yeah. engine is not in linear fashion following no. your road speed. That's yeah. so odd. It feels like you're running on a treadmill. You know, yeah. you're running flat out and you're going nowhere. We had yeah. a Rav Four recently, just the you know the, the you know a middle grade petrol four cylinder, 
and I almost got out and ripped that transmission out of the car. I was wow. that pissed Fantastic. off with us. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize you were that strong. Um, I tried. Yeah, I, I couldn't do it. But they don't. They don't work in mid spec. Uh, you know, petrol engined mid size SUVs. Like no, they really so don't work. I mean, that that to yeah. me is the big question mark around the the WRX Sport Wagon. Is mm. is that transmission just going to be the Achilles heel that kind of sucks one of, one of the saving graces is if you do have the manual paddle shifts and you choose particular points along the CVT's kind of travel um, and mimic ratio specific ratios yeah that that works fine so yeah. if you want to, if you want to drive it in a manual mode you can but that's not always what you want to do no yeah no, anyway just... there's the rant on CVT's yeah. please join in anybody listening or watching um, so that's that's coming our way next year. And one that's already with us is the Skoda Octavia RS wagon. And, you know, just quietly and maybe not so quietly, the Octavia RS has built a really solid reputation um, as a terrific performance-focused sedan. Um, and the wagon, it's, it's one of the few wagons around now. And there you go. It's got a seven-speed dual clutch, two-litre, um, four-cylinder, 180 kilowatts, 370 newton metres. Um, but the thing is, it's now just under 50K before you put it on the road. So yeah. it's it's no longer the sneaky kind of bargain performance Volkswagen backdoor well, sort of thing. Having, having said that, I mean, it's still, uh, it's still cheaper several grand cheaper than a, than a Golf GTI, you know, because we've said in the past, you know, the written in the past, you know, the whole hot hatch segment has gone north in, in a big way in the last couple of years. Yeah. I actually think, it's true. you know, the, the bang for your buck with the Octavia RS, because it's a fantastic interior, you know, it's a really like polished premium car. It's not like a cheapy, you know, like yes. hot hatches used to be just like a, you know, a basic car with a big engine. It's, this is a real, quite a premium thing. I actually would say the Octavia RS wagon is, one of the, my favorite cars that I've driven this year. I just really loved it. I think as a package, it's sporty, but it's still easy to live with, practical, mm. it's mm. fun to drive. Like it sort of ticks the boxes that you look for in that fast wagon. All right. Well, I, I, take, I take that back to a degree then because also you, you make a good point. It used to be the case that Skoda was a generation or so behind in terms of yeah. the tech relative to its Volkswagen sibling. And that's not so much the case anymore. So uh, that's a very good point you make. Yeah, exactly. look, we, we we're a Skoda family. We've got we've got a Skoda in our family, and look, um, it's Volkswagen Tech, Audi Tech, in a you know a slightly more affordable package. But I mean, as Stephen says, like it, we, it's kind of losing that edge now because it is getting pricier and pricier. Um, but at the same time, I still think it's packaged, you know, from an interior perspective, better than a Volkswagen. Um, yeah. You know. The whole simply clever business is is not just a marketing mm. line. Well, it is just a marketing line, but the, right, you know, but it's, but they, they back storage it up. is really good. They do back yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah, do yeah. back it up. Absolutely. I mean, I know, I know, Richard, your little boy Fabia. He loves, uh, he loves Skodas. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's been the that way, way since you were born. Right. Yes, that's right. Should no, we, look, <laughs> we probably should put a disclaimer on this at this point. But I do. There is a sort of a trend within. The, the car journalist profession that we are sort of slightly biased towards wagons, right? Like yeah, they yeah, are, like, right. Love like, a wagon. Particularly yeah. fast wagons. Like, yeah. Oh, full disclosure. Like, yeah, like yeah. compared yeah. to the general population, I just think yeah. people should know that we know that we're a little bit different. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. we don't need to wagon. come out yeah. in our wagon. In All right, wagon. well, I mean, that that the only thing about that Octavia wagon is it's 30 kegs heavier, which is not a massive penalty mm. when you think about um, the extra practicality you get with that car. And you're in, you know, sub seven second range, zero to hundred. So even just in a straight line, it's a, it's a pretty rapid proposition. It's also, I mean, buying a Skoda as well, it means that you've actually, I think it's like a, a, a thought purchase rather like kind of like Saab was totally um, a few totally. years ago. So you could have bought, you know, a Mazda, you could have bought, you know, a Ford or something else or a Volkswagen. You didn't, you chose a Skoda. And it's a That's very so true, Richard. purchase. I yeah. couldn't agree with you more. My brother yeah. was a, he went through phases and he went through a strong Saab phase and now he's a Skoda owner. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think there's a lot of that. It's the, I want a European yeah. brand, but I'm not fussy about the premium end. Yeah. I just want something pragmatic and quality. You know, you, uh -huh. know what the, you know what it is? It's kind of like I kind of consider there's certain cars I can call sort of like Android cars, you know, like in terms of like an Android <laughs> phone, right? Right. Like an iPhone is the obvious smartphone to get, but yep. in terms of like functionality, it doesn't actually do anything really different than, the, than a whole bunch of other different phones. Sure, you can get yes. For cheaper that might actually do 
from different brands, right? And so it's a bit like a McLaren versus a Ferrari. Like you kind of yep. choose it because it's then Skoda, I think, is the same sort of thing. Like you choose it because yeah. you know exactly what it's capable of. It does exactly what you want to do. Mm. And it does it in, in a different way or it's wrapped up in a different package. Yep. Yeah, that's it. That's, and, that's and, true. And, and you know, some people might be turned off by the quirky styling or the fact that it's not a, you know, prestige European brand. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But it's that pragmatism. I could probably afford to buy a, mm. a much more expensive car, but I choose to get this one because it just fits what I want in a car without yep. being flashy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Now, the <laughs> next one, speaking about that whole Volkswagen group, it's a Volkswagen. Um, the Golf R, so you're stepping up into all-wheel drive territory, really, really strong engine, um, sub five seconds, zero to 100 performance, Golf R wagon. And further to Steve's point about um, Journos loving wagons, when the Golf R wagon last did the rounds of the Cars Guide garage, um, there were there were close to fist fights in terms of who was who's going to have a steer at that. It, it did get quite tense. It did. Um, it was, you he, you head butted me in the chest, Jason. I did. It was a Liverpool Careful, kiss. Really, it was a sign, out with his sign of affection. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a great. It was such a great little package in the seven seven point five um, golf generation. Mm. Um, so first quarter of next year, we'll be um, steering down the barrel of the the Golf Eight version of the R. And like I said, sub five second, 4.9 0 to 100, 235 kilowatts, 420 newton meters of torque. I mean, in a, in a little car. And yet, even with the rear seats up, you've got 611 litres of luggage capacity. Um, put the back seats down and it's over 1,600 litres. Um, and, it, and it's got a drift mode. Um, yeah. So it's this kind of magical combination of performance and this day-to-day -day practicality. What a, what a ripper. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I mean, that's a car I'm looking forward to because I did love the last one. I remember a, a particular drive like late at night on a great piece of road that, um, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say too much more about, but and yeah, her, it was. Her it was, name was Stephanie. You had, you was, had Stephanie in the passenger seat. It was, it was dream. Yeah, it was just, it was I was a Datsun 1600. Yeah, I was just like, I just got in the zone because like, it was such a good car, right. like such a right. great car for that kind of like. Like as a as a car to drive, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that's the key with mm -hmm. some of these wagons is they can be, you know, not to get too technical, that the longer wheelbase can actually help them, like give them more stability in, you know, when you're cornering. Yes. Uh, but they can also sometimes be a bit too long, and that makes them slow. Whereas yes. I think the 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 Golf and the and the Skoda are probably that sweet spot in terms of adding a little bit more wheelbase to get you like yep. a bit more stability, but yep. still being fun and you can, you know, throw it around. And that's, that to me is sort of what really stood out amongst, about the old one was that it was just such a, it was still a really fun car to drive. That's so true. I agree because there was this traditional wisdom that said the front wheel drives lighter GTI was, was quite light on its feet and nimble and all that stuff. And when you went to the R, it had a, a, a more substantial feel to it and was hunkered down. I don't think that's so much the case anymore. In the, in the last generation of Golf, the R had a lot of those GTI attributes, yeah. yet it had that extra performance and the all-wheel drive uh, as well. It was just such a great package. I do. I do I'm mean, slightly disappointed. It doesn't have a whole lot more power and, and torque. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly mild uh, mm -hmm. upgrade, which is somewhat disappointing. I mean, I, I imagine... Primarily, they're just putting resources into electric vehicles of Volkswagen these days. But, Maybe, yeah. you know, and, and I think there's obviously some emissions issues around extracting more performance. But, um, yes. yeah, look, it's certainly... It's the, certainly things, the things you can do, though, uh, with the right tuning house, um, yeah. Mr. Otley, though, like those Volkswagen engines are capable of so much output and those dual clutch transmissions are really pretty robust these days. But yeah, I've got to admit, yeah. straight out of the box, when you drive a Golf R at a, at a racetrack, you know, uh, you you feel like it does run out a bit of puff on a on a straight, which has got you know any length in it. Uh, yes. You're yeah. kind of going go 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 go. But on yes. a country road, uh, that feels plenty powerful enough. Well, um, I mean, it's a great point you make, Richard, because uh, person I know very oh no, it's me um, <laughs> has has gone down. Uh, several <laughs> hill climb monster rabbit holes on mm. YouTube, and you look at those highly tuned oh. uh, golfs and and even older Sirocco's and things. The amount of performance uh, tuning stuff that's available in the aftermarket for those cars is mind blowing. Um, yeah, so if you want more power, yeah. it wouldn't be far away. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, 
Yeah, I mean, they're just I, I, like I think you're right in the sense that the Golf R it, it strikes me as more of a road car than a track car. It's not the kind yeah. of car that you really would like to go and do track stuff with because it's a bit more sophisticated, a bit more polished than your average hot hatch. And so, I mean, particularly in a wagon form, you know, it's going to be the ideal kind of car that to you know do the school run and go and do the shopping. Yeah. But then you can still, when the road suits and conditions suit, yeah. you can have a heck of a lot of fun in it. Yes, yes. I, like, and as you say, like, it's such an everyday car. Like, yeah. getting in a golf R, you don't feel like you also need to stop off by the chiropractor. You're getting yes. to, you know, some, you know, hot wagons and the ride is so firm that yep. you're just like, oh, far out. This is almost yes. unlivable. But a golf yeah. R, you know, like, they have worked so hard to absolutely balance performance with practicality, with yeah. comfort. I don't think that there is a another wagon in that that segment which is that refined and spot on. Um, That's a terrific point because just, it takes so much time and money oh, and effort to get that balance right. And a lot yeah, of people, a lot of car absolutely. brands don't bother. No, <laughs> it's it's not no. the yeah. It's safe to say it's not the fastest no. hot hatch by hot wagon by any stretch. But it is probably the best all rounder. Yeah, I think yeah. that's why. You know, I've had plenty of friends ask me, "Well, you know, what high hat should I buy?" And you kind of inevitably end up uh, at a Golf R or a Golf R wagon because yeah. they're well, that's because right. people are like, oh, you, you got to drive it every day. Like, do you really yes. want a manual? You know, well, that's it because you're you rec- like if you recommended the Subaru WRX wagon, I think you'd go, yeah, yeah, no, that's a great car. But at night time, you'd lie there thinking. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you'd be like, yeah, you'd, you'd be feeling bad about walk. that. You'd be like, yeah. I'm just waiting for them to see me the next party and go, "Well, what's it like?" Yes, like, yeah, you know. You should tell me about the transmission. <laughs> yeah, you did that, that, Richard. Why would you? It's a really to- troubling yeah, image yeah. of you lying awake yeah. at night, Richard, just thinking about CBT. <laughs> well, I mean, having said that, I would recommend in this in this category, I would have no qualm recommending the Skoda too. I think that's yeah. you know yeah. of the three, it's probably you know. Well, look, let's let's move from one that's about the driving to one that, with all due respect, may not be so much about the driving as the way it looks, which is the Genesis G70 shooting brake. Now, Genesis is really playing a pretty strong game at the moment in terms of its styling and design, um, and the shooting brake is a such, to my eyes anyway, such a beautifully handsome extension of the, the G70 sedan, and we're going to see it um, as part of the 2022 facelifted G70 Family. So, and and if you choose to go with the uh, V6, so it's a 3.3 litre twin turbo uh, petrol V6, 274 kilowatts, 510 newton meters. That's not to be laughed at. Uh, Rear wheel drive, eight speed, paddle shifted auto. So it it looks fantastic and also gets up and runs. It, It could be a really interesting next step for Genesis. Yeah, I I saw one uh, when I was recently, you know you know, doing some business out at Hyundai, grabbing a car, and it's a good-looking thing. It's yeah. a really sharp-looking no thing. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it's, it's. I think it's good for Genesis to do different things, you know, to try and be unique because they, yeah. they're they not really, you know, standing out from the pack in terms of, of what they're doing. The you know, disappointing thing with it is it still has the original interior. Right. Yeah. Or well, uh, no, it does, I think it has the facelifted interior, doesn't it? Okay. I, I, I assume so. I worry about so. Genesis as well. It's, that's another thing that keeps me awake. Oh, Can they do it? You, yeah, you, yeah. Just, you don't sleep well, much, yeah? I think yeah. <laughs> the obvious comparison is Infinity, isn't it? You know, in terms yeah. of there was a brand that came into the market for the second time uh, mm. with, with humble aspirations. We're going to build over time. Mm. And actually, they didn't build at all and just cut their losses and exited. Whereas Genesis, if Genesis is to be believed, mm. they are, again, genuinely in for the long haul. They want to establish this intrigue around the brand. They're not fussed about sales to begin with. They're going to invest in all of that and, and slowly build it up. And, and they mm. are, but the numbers are still really small. So yeah. to because Steve's of, point, it, yeah. you, you've got to do something different or else you're just going to yeah. be. They've got the money, to, though. Yeah. They've got the money. This, like Nissan didn't have the money to be able to keep, you know, um, pushing infinity and I, but i think if anyone's got the money it's hyundai and they'll probably just keep pumping money into it like toyota did for 30 years yeah Lexus, well that's they, yeah. they need that kind of thing because i mean at, mm. at the moment why would you buy a, a g70 sedan over a, a c-class or a three series or an a4 yeah. like there's yeah. nothing that really pops on it whereas at mm. least with shooting brake 
Mm. Um, you know, the other cars have, there's other, other wagons available in the segment, yeah. Yep. But at least, you know, twin turbo V6 wagon, it's kind of, it's kind well, of. Well, in, in uh, talking different. to senior people in, in Genesis in Australia, what they've said, what they've found early on when these numbers are quite small is that it's people with multiples of cars have come along and gone, eh, that's interesting. That kind of looks mm-hmm. different. And they've just bought one on a whim almost. Like, yeah, I'll have one yeah. of those and see, and see what it's like. That's not going to be a sustainable business model, mind you. No. Um, but something like this shooting break will pique people's interest. And it mm-hmm. is something that's yeah. a bit different. But can we just, just acknowledge that a shooting brake is supposed to be a two-door? This is, again, this is a conversation we had yes. off air. Um, yes. Is this whole... Uh, and we went naming... into the realm of four-door coupes. Yeah. And, yes, uh, and the whole I mean, bit. Yeah. Yeah. Four-door coupe, is a, it, to me, is a phrase I always use in, in inverted commas <laughs> because it's not a four-door coupe. It's like saying I'm... I'm Bone dry and stopping wet at the same just, time. Like just it's not, it's not a be thing. careful uh, punctuating your sentences there, Steve, because you'll have to go the whole way. <laughs> it's just, and then you'll, you know, what do you think will happen next? Who you've, knows? you've, exclamation you've got a, point. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, but I just, it, it, like, yeah, I mean, I just think it's them trying to be different, trying to be cool. I mean, you yep. can't call it a wagon. I mean, yep. Audi guess they call their wagons avants, but um, well, yeah. well, but do you know that the French word coupe means to cut short? So it doesn't matter whether it's got four doors or not. And it goes back to carriages. And if you have a cut short carriage, can still have four doors, but coupe just means to cut. My cut understanding short. was so that when you were dropped in, when you were dropped in the guillotine and you had oh. your head lopped off, you were you got coupe. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you still had four four limbs. You just my you're understanding just shorter. in an automotive sense, though, is a coupe is a two door car with a sloping roof line. And a well, shooting brake is a two door car. car with well, a it became known as that. And that's because it's Americans. They're coupes. Coupes. Mm. Well, Rover <laughs> in the P5 four door coupe, they started the, the whole thing rolling um, back whenever that was. I want to say 60s, um, probably early 60s. Um, and there was probably something before that. But um, yeah, it's, it's problematic. But it's just words. It's all BS. Yeah. It's all just, just words. Just right. words. Which uh, a whole thing. separate podcast. A whole separate yeah. podcast. <laughs> that, wouldn't that be a podcast? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, like, but like the, why is mini all in caps? It's shouting at it. It's true. Well, why is a swear word? Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next one is a pretty um, enticing combination of wagon and performance. M3 Touring. So uh, Tony, in writing the story, said that performance fanatics had been screaming at BMW. They're probably picketing the four-cylinder building in Munich about um, why don't you have a, a touring, aka wagon version of mm. the M3. You've left the field open. Um, Audi RS4 Avant, there's that name. Um, a C63 AMG Estate, there's another one. Um, so we finally had confirmation that G80 generation uh, M3, there will be a touring. Uh, it, was con- it was confirmed last year. Um, but some say, what, the X3M already fulfills that kind of brief for a useful but fast BMW. Well, this one will be really fast. Um, 353 kilowatts, 550 newton meters, turbo inline six, wide body wagon body shell, extra girth. We've got a teaser shot um, for people watching on YouTube. It should be pretty special. I, I, that's a car I'd be looking forward to. I don't yeah. know you guys. It's yeah, to kind be- of the ultimate like wagon, isn't it really? I mean, if the M3 is the ultimate sedan, then that's kind of the ultimate wagon in a lot of ways. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I would a question whether the M3 still is the ultimate sedan. I think that, that like, that's one of those things that uh, that has shaken up. You know, that's a very competitive segment now. But, what do you mean? What would you uh, rate over an M3 sedan? C63 is a fantastic car. The, Get out the, of town? Oh, you've got to be a real estate agent to have one of those. Oh, wow. Even, like, I would Commercial just, or residential? <laughs> residential. Residential. <laughs> yeah. I would not even dismiss the, um, uh, the Alpha either. So, uh, oh, what the the Julia Quadrifoglio? Yeah, that's a fantastic car. (laughs) Yeah, it's actually pretty good. The new M3 is, is although each one wants to kill its driver, right? Potentially. Well, you can't hold that in my opinion. Depends on the driver, not at all. Yeah, look, and certainly, yeah. I hope we can agree that the X3M is nothing to write home about. Um, I was cool. thoroughly cool. underwhelmed by that as a car. But this, the interesting thing about the M3 Touring to me is it might be one of the very few cars on the market where the back end looks better than the front end. Right. Yeah. You, know, you don't say yeah, that. That's, right. that's the grill. The grill factor. The grill and is, I suppose it opens up a whole other conversation, which again is probably another podcast about the nature of M and AMG 
and Quattro or Audi Performance or whatever it's it's mm. called these days. Yeah, um, about whether where it's gone. M, you know, go back 20, 30 years. The E30 um, M3 was lightweight and simple and quite analog, and you really felt it. You were connected to everything it did and to the road. Mm. And now a car like the M5 is so big and beefy and brutally fast, but you just don't have any sense of that of that intimacy that you once had with an M car. Yeah. Um, it's it's changed dramatically over time. Yeah, this is the thing, right? And this is this is probably my issue really with the with the M3. You know, to get back to it is 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 it doesn't have that connection, right? It no. doesn't have that kind of connection that I, you know, I prefer like a C63 in terms of the, the feedback. Like- Where I think the M answer is the M2. That, that, uh, yeah. that is more your old school M in terms of the way it feels to drive yeah. in my book. But anyway. the, other, the other issue to me with the, with, the, with the smaller M cars is the engine, that, that six cylinder, they're trying yes. to extract so much power from it, particularly in the last one, the way, and, and BMW just has a, has a, has a, just, they just, stiffer is faster that's the only right. way they think about performance like right how do we make it faster make it stiffer, stiffer. Like, just keep okay. making well. it stiffer and stiff the last m3 m4 was just like it was it was really good in this tiny little window it was like it was on a knife's edge the whole time and either side of that it was just it was too fussy it was like it was like too highly strung it just didn't work that's- but steve that's also because you're a maniac and you drive cars on a knife edge all the time yeah that's just your approach to drive that's how i live life you do. Um, Good luck. Quarter mile yeah. at a story, time yes, story. Yeah, that's life. right. Whatever the saying half, in the movie half is. quarter mile at a time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, movie. look. Let's let's in terms of Tony's uh, cars that he's called out. Yes. The last one is arguably the most interesting in that we've been we've been teased about um, rumors and semi confirmation of a GR Corolla uh, for some time. Uh, allegedly, the whole COVID pandemic has thrown a spanner in the works in terms of. The rollout schedule uh, for that car were supposed to be a 2021 car, uh, now into a 2022, late 2022. Um, but the really tantalising prospect is a wagon version of that car. So it will use, we're led to believe, um, an even more upgraded version of the three-cylinder um, turbo, 1.6 turbo, that's in the GR Yaris. Um, and you've got that um, GR4 all-wheel drive system. But this uh, Corolla will be wider, lower, and whether it comes to Australia is less certain. And Tony said, look, just put it in the hopeful optimism basket um, that it would come here. But that, to me, sounds like a a pretty interesting prospect too. Mm. I mean, I would be hopefully optimistic. simply because I mean, I would have said, you know, two years ago that the idea of this car was fantasy and that it was, was, you know, wishful thinking. Um, but man, they built a rally homologation special <laughs> and sold totally. it. You know, yeah, so totally. who knows what Toyota's going to do? They brought back exactly. Super, they brought back Supra, and then you know, even that that was kind of special. But then to do what they did with the Yaris mm. uh, is kind of crazy. Um, That's it. So Toyota's pulling all the rabbits out of the hat. Um, we didn't think there'd be, you know, Supra. We didn't think there'd be that Yaris. Uh, you know, far out a wagon chat version about, of chat the about an MR2, chat MR2, about Celica. Celica. Yep. Look, anything's possible. Yeah, I would have said it. no a year ago, but I don't know now. They could. Yeah, it's mm. it's like that. It's like that. It's like I don't know. It's like a you know, the 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 purse strings have been opened. It's like they've realised. Oh, you know. Yeah. I'm go- it's like this, it's like they've been given a terminal illness or something, and they're just like, boom, let's 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 Jeez. do everything. It'd be Jeez. interesting, you Jeez, know. Oddly, that's depressing. <laughs> okay, here's are... a better analogy. It's like, do you remember that Richard Pryor classic, <laughs> uh, Brewster's Millions of the 1980s? That's I do. A dated reference for it. It's like they're just like, let's go, let's spend some money, let's like, let's build some. Do you know? Do you know, do you know the best want. scene? The best scene in Brewster's Millions is where <laughs> he, as an accountant minion, has determined that he can siphon off fractions of cents from people's uh, pay packets into a separate account. And he doesn't realise how quickly the money's going to stack up and he, he just gets super rich. And the forensic accountants come in and determine what's happening. And they say, we're either dealing with a genius or, <laughs> and just as they say, or you hear, da 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 and it's him pulling in the car park in a Ferrari 308 I don't remember that he's that just thing. gone out and bought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember yes. the scene with the stamp. Oh, the stamp uh, was great. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, genius. Genius. Comic genius. Absolutely yeah. gen- mm. genius. So, mm. um, all right. Well, look, let's leave all of Tony's picks behind and have a crack ourselves mm. at the, the fast wagon that we think. And it could be present. It could be past. 
that we think is the best. Can I lead off, please? Sure. And um, I'm going to go with the Merck AMG CLS 63S shooting brake. And sadly, Steve, it is a four-door um, shooting brake. Four-door coupe term Four, shooting yes, brake. Yes, all, because... all of those. It's a <laughs> Avant uh, estate brake. During... Right. Yeah, touring touring break. Break. <laughs> and it, it was i think we last saw it in this market 2014 it was the older 5.5 liter twin turbo v8 it's just under 600 horsepower 430 kilowatts 800 newton meters all-wheel drive zero to 100 3.6 seconds and a lazy 265k in 2014 but it had that wooden um load area in the back it was it was a a beautiful Q ship, you know, it, it really didn't shout its performance uh, to the rooftops, but what a car that was. I, I loved it. But I've got to say, I've got a lot of time for the one you're going to call out, Steve, as well. So where are you at? Well, I mean, I think t- not to be unkind, but the uh, the king of all performance wagons, oh, which God. is the undisputed king of all performance wagons. The Audi RS6 Avant. Yeah, now, see, brilliant. I copped a lot of flack last time I was on here with Greg Rust uh, uh, calling me out on social media for saying I would buy a Kia Carnival if I won Lotto. <laughs> um, but just for the record, if I did yes. win Lotto, I would buy more than a Kia Carnival. Like, All right. it, would be, it would be yes. one of many cars. Uh, <laughs> including, I mean, look, the Kia would be a great like family hauler, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have a twin turbo V8 and like 441 kilowatts or whatever the Audi has um, yes. that could just like out drag Lamborghinis, you know, yes. and like be lucky enough uh, in this job to like do some drifting in it. Like it's just a, it's just a, and it, awesome, it is another awesome sleeper, car. isn't it? It's, it's yeah. relatively understated. It's only when you look mm. at the size of the mm. rubber under it, it, it yeah, uh, that you those, really get the when hint. you know, you know, it's one of those, when you yeah. know, you know, cars, like you see it in a, most people see in a parking lot and go, oh, it's a wagon. That's boring. It's a wagon. And that's kind of the appeal of these fast wagons is they kind of, you look at them and go, hmm. there's a wagon, the there's wagon. a station wagon, yeah, yeah. whatever. And then, you know, you can out drag a Porsche at the traffic lights or whatever. Absolutely. You know? like, just- and, um, and Richard, you've <clears throat> gone yes. home, you've gone homegrown. Well, um, I have gone homegrown, but I've got, I've got, a, I've got, a, I've got to pull Otley up on, on something. Oh. I reckon the last generation RS6 Avant was better. Not, not better performance wise, but just look better. Like okay. The wheels, the dimensions, the whole proportions of this, I think it's fifth generation RS6 event, it just looks a bit wacky do. Uh, I reckon yeah, the last I one just looked. Mm. I think they all look good. Quite it looked I think, fat. It, it I looked, think mm. Audi have kind of nailed the fast wagon better than anyone. You know, that's kind of, it's kind of, because yeah. it's kind of their, it was for a long time. They're, they're, this, mm. they're, they're you know, the USP was that they would, they wouldn't do. Yep an RS4 sedan, they would only do the RS4 Avant. They wouldn't do an RS6 sedan, they would only do the RS6 Avant. So, you know, cars yeah. like the RS2, like they were, they that's kind true. of specialised, you know, that's that's their thing. And so I think, that's right. that, yeah, look, to be honest, man, I would take any RS2 And Richard, can Avant. I just award you two points for use of the phrase wacky do? That's <laughs> Fantastic. I, look, I, thank you. Thank you very much, JC. It's been a while since I've used wacky do. Um, yeah, it's nice. But- I talk of wacky do. I love cars that scare me. And look, and the thing is, we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about the Golf R before, and it doesn't doesn't really scare me, but that RS six scares me. And it's, it's kind of it's a, it's just such a proper fast like, car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like so, and then you know the Alfa Romeo uh, Julia as well. You know the Quadrifoglio that scares me too. Um, yeah. Great cars scare you, scare you. Yeah. Um, I find, so I reckon I've gone homegrown for my uh, wagon and that is the last of the V8s. It's the SSV Redline Sport Wagon. It's a bullet, 6.2 litre V8, 304 kilowatts, 570 newton metres, zero to 104.9 seconds. Mm. It's just, you know, it's got its faults. It doesn't feel as well glued together as an RS6 Avant, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper. They don't make them anymore. You can change a nappy. In the cargo area, which I've done when my son was just a bub. I was like um, I said, it was your solo trip around Australia. Yeah, it was actually my nappy. You were trying hard. to break um, a record, yeah. Very oh, hard to change your own. Tough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I just love it. And look, while I'm at it as well, can I, a bit of a shout out to the Chrysler 300 SRT oh, wow. station wagon as well mm, with its okay. Hemi 
It's got looks only a Hemi mother could love, but again, far out. You had, yeah. you had me at Holden, you lost me at Chrysler. <laughs> I mean, I, oh, I look, love... It looks like a hearse, but it yeah. goes like a it will get you. It will get you to the funeral on time. <laughs> yes. Unreal. Yeah. Beasts, I, I mean, both beasts. Yeah. Look, yeah. I, I, lo- I love that Holden wagon. The mm. you know, and the HSV Tura version of it yeah. was was you mm. know great. They were again just like beautiful great. wagon. Great, yeah. great design. You know, the, really, really. The, they good. looked good. They drove really well. You know, as a car, they were cars that Australia could really be proud of, and it's a real right. shame that they're not around anymore. It cool. Is. Now, speaking of driving really well. Um, we're going to move to our garage. So thank you very much for that discussion. And anybody uh, who's listening or watching, feel free to join that conversation about fast wagons and let us know your thoughts. Um, But we'll now move to our garage and cars that we have indeed been driving in the recent past. And Steve, can I start with you, please? Um, You've been in a so-called commercial vehicle, but a particular derivation of it. Yeah. So I'm in the Navara, Navara Pro 4X. Um, which is obviously their sportier version. I guess you could call it sportier. Yep. Is it sportier? Yep. Yeah, I guess yep. it's sportier. They I look guess, amazing. Yeah, it looks great. That two, yeah. It's got the same. It's got the same two point three twin turbo diesel four cylinder. Mm. You know, was one hundred and forty kilowatts, four hundred and fifty newton meters. So it's not. It's not uh, a Raptor in the sense of uh, performance, but it's mm. a, it. To me, it like. I guess to me the appeal is that it looks good. Like it's a really mm. good looking car. It has a bit more off road, I think, ability. But you know, but it's you know it's got the big chunky tires with the yeah. riding on them. It's got the sports bar. It's just you know. <laughs> the riding on them. Yeah. yeah. Does it say Buzz? Does it say Buzz Lightyear around? <laughs> yeah, light years, light years. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, yeah, light years. Uh, yeah, no, it, it just it just looks the part, right? I mean, I think, and I think you know, for all um, you know, let's talk of wagons that are kind of a niche. Uh, thing that mostly loved by car journalists, uh, mm-hmm. you know, dressed up utes are, you know, primo utes are incredibly popular. <laughs> so, you are. know, it makes sense that uh, Nissan would build one. Well, the, the, the yeah. thing that we've struck on recently in our conversations about utes was as a family transport, they're compromised, even if you do have a hard tonneau on the back. Yeah. If you just want to wear what you would typically throw in the boot, throwing mm-hmm. in the tray of a ute, it's just not the same. So you need a yes. divider package or something to mm. help you locate those things. Well, just just from a just, I mean, in my personal experience, uh, I needed to use it uh, to take my son to sport. You know, his sporting team. Oh, you I, put your son in the back. Yeah, because so fantastic. Should I put him inside? Oh, just, I used to ro- ride just, in the back he, of my brother's. Youth he doesn't like my time. music, and so you know, it's just easier. No, but I, 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 you know, I coach his little baseball team, and so I had to put like yeah. the equipment in the tray, and of course it's yeah. raining, yeah. so it just gets wet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What are you going to do? Like yeah. you yeah. can't, you know, like look, I put some equipment in the back seat because I could, but I couldn't fit it all in. You know, yes. well, that's the thing. So, we I did a um actually it, it's it's overdue, but it's coming next week. Uh, is a family test of the um, Navara. Um, yeah, and yeah, I found exactly the same thing. When you've got kids in the back, where do you put your shopping? I mean, you can yeah. go lift your legs up, squish it in between you, but you don't really want to do that. It's not well, my, safe my, or my kids are older; they've got they've got they've got legs that they can't really get out of the way. You know, there's going to yeah. crush stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and look, other, you, the, the you have to push. I'm oh, sorry, go. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Sorry. The other compromise is really how they drive. It is a big, heavy. Like they've gotten better. No doubt, mm. they are better than they've ever been in terms of mm. driving. They don't. They're not. It's not really like driving a truck. But it's, I guess, a bit more like driving a, you know, a, a 10, 15 year old SUV, you know, yes. like it's got heavier mm. steering, yes. you know, like it's just, it, you know, it rolls around a bit more like they they are better with still like if you just want family transport. Yeah, you'd be way better off buying an SUV. You right. know? But yeah, but if you want the, you know, if you're not too worried about it being a family car, yeah. you know, if you just want the looks and, the, and you do want to chuck stuff, you know, that you don't care about. Like, yeah. Yep getting wet or dirty or whatever in the back and you can't get yeah. a tonneau cover you can cover it up but um it's a real conundrum yeah. because that reluctance to put stuff in the back means that you're invariably putting loose objects in the cabin which mm. can be dangerous you know in yep. a collision Projectiles. particularly if it's yeah. i mean it, the baseball equipment you put the hard stuff in the back yeah. i suppose and yeah, yeah. but, but, the, it's, other, it's the, tricky. but the, the other thing i would say is we're talking about a, like a very high specification ute it doesn't have like an inbuilt hard tonneau. Yeah. You know, like yes. probably, you know, at that, at that level, probably yeah. should have it. Like, yeah. 
But um, for, can for I just reason, point out as well how difficult and weird it is to put child seats in those as well, where you've got to feed the strap through the hook. There's like a loop, and then it oh, goes yeah. uh, sort of like along the sort of like parallel with the side of the car, and then it hooks around a center one. It, it doesn't feel right. Wow. And I know that Nissan were pulled up on that originally when that when that generation came out, and they had to fix that because in a crash test, that oh. fabric hook tore. And they had to strengthen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's fixed okay. now. So there's no problems now. But yeah, it still doesn't feel right, even though it is. Yeah. yeah. But to the right good. family, to the right family, I think I think the Ute is a good family car. If you're an off-roading family and you, you know, mum or dad's a tradie uh, and you do get dividers and a lockable tonneau cover, I reckon you could make it work yeah. as a family car. Okay. Yeah. But if it, and that's yeah. fair. But equally, like if you're a single man or woman or you just like off-roading and you just want a tough mm. truck it kind of ticks it t- ticks yeah. those boxes really well like Absolutely. it does it looks Good. it has great like presence curb appeal yeah like Unreal. Great presence it's like that's real yeah anyway good one thank you steve now richard uh yes. this is fresh news um your story on this vehicle has gone up overnight we're yep. recording this on on the uh friday yep um tell us about it please Cars in my garage, I've just got back from the launch, is the new generation Kia Sportage. So this is a rival to the Toyota RAV4, the Mazda CX-5, the Hyundai Tucson. Actually, it's really closely related to the Tucson. Yep. And it's got uh, very similar drivetrains. It's got a 1.6, the the top of the line GT line has got a 1.6 litre turbo petrol with a dual clutch and back to back. And I drove the Tucson pretty much back to back with uh, um, the Sportage. Sportage transmission is a lot smoother. That Tucson has a little bit of a lurchiness to it. Oh, um, okay. No issues there with the Sportage. Um, prices, they start in the, where, where are we here? They start at 32000 You can get a manual gearbox, and I drove it. Right. And it was right. heaps of fun. Not much fun in the city, but heaps of fun on the country roads we drove it on. Uh, so it starts at 32445 and then tops out with the diesel GT line for 52370 That's the uh, MSRP, the recommended retail price. The GT line has these curved uh, dual 12.3H screens, which wrap oh, around. Yes. Yeah, I've seen oh, the wow. pics. Um, yeah. the it's, and it's, you know, five years ago, it was only Mercedes-Benz that was doing the, you know, the full dashboard length screens. And now, you know, you've come a long way when, when Kia are doing it. Um, one of the last cars in Australia to have a Australian uh, suspension tune because, as we know, Hyundai's moving away from that now. So this car was tuned by Graham Gamble. Uh, yep. So actual, actual, you know, springs and dampers on the ground, trial and error, getting them right uh, until he found the right uh, combination. So it, it felt really good. It handled pretty well too. Um, and it looks... You probably I love the one. way it looks. I'm, yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big fan. I think it looks amazing. It looks yeah. like an alien that's gonna eat you. It's just so. Yeah. And those those LED headlights, they want me to love them. Yeah, love it. they're awesome. Yeah. It's a, a really really good look. And look, when you when you're in the lower grades inside, it doesn't look as good as that GT line. Um, and there's some blank panels which you can stick your own stickers on. Um, yes. Nothing but, um, like <laughs> switch blanks to tell you that you're not in the top model. <laughs> just, you know to, what? just to really smack you around the face. We had, I-, I had, we had no money when I was a kid, and we always got the base grade. And it was the cars, which basically had a steering wheel and a gear shifter, and yeah. it was just everything was blank panels. And we just used to just stick had stickers seats, on them. Eh? Yeah, that's right. It had seats. One day when we got a Ford Laser once, they accidentally put a radio in it, and they let us keep it. Whoa, oh, we thought we were in oh, we paradise. <laughs> Anyway, that's the Kia Sportage. It's uh, it's out now, but the wait list could be it's a while. Unreal. Oh, yeah, the that's review cool. is up and the video I, is up too. It's I good. find I find the whole the question about looks quite interesting because mm. uh, the the model it just replaced, I was not a fan of when it arrived. I thought, yeah. Ooh, okay, they've they've gone a step too far because I liked the the predecessor. I thought it was quite a sharp looking one. So yeah. two generations ago, mm. yep. I thought that's sharp, and then they went to the huge the grill, guys. and, and yeah. you're like. Yeah. Okay, I think you maybe went a little <laughs> far there, Ken. I think you maybe like that you, you know, some you know, like the designers maybe went to their head. Yeah. But actually, over the course of its life cycle, uh, it, actually yeah. fit, it actually grew, grew on me, and it fit into traffic better. Like it, it kind yeah. of aged gracefully as opposed to aging badly. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see. Like I, I would, say, I haven't actually seen a Sportage in the metal, so it's, I'm only mm. looking at the photos and. It, 
you know, they, and I've only look, seen high grade and they look quite good in high grade. But in, um, in the middle, it looks longer than it does oh, in really? the photos. There's actually quite a long car. It's so 4.66 metres. So that, that was the issue with the last portage. They made it too small. So when they brought the Seltos in, the yes. Seltos was almost exactly the same uh, size. I see. So yes. what they really needed to do, and that's the white reason why Sportage could never really compete properly with Grab 4 or CX-5 because they're bigger SUVs. They had more legroom. This one's actually longer than a Rav 4. It's yeah. got a bigger boot than a Rav 4. So, so it's yeah, actually that's the key. Yes. So in, yes. in yeah. glorious, in glorious hindsight, uh -huh. the Seltos' size was a big clue to the fact that the uh -huh. next Sportage yes. was going to be bigger. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the Sportage yeah. is exactly what it needs to be now. Interesting. And I mean, in a lot of ways, I think it's better than the Rav and better than the Tucson. So yeah. Cool. Mm. Thank you, Richard. That's Thank good. You. Um, now I'll finish things off. I've been in, and we were talking about golfs earlier, the Golf GTI. Um, All right. So it's just to get the money out of the way, 53,100. So that proves your point, Steve, about uh, proximity to the Octavia mm -hmm. RS. It's, um, it's dearer than that car. Two litre turbo four, seven speed dual clutch and it's front wheel drive, of course. Um, 180 kilowatts, 370 newton metres. That torque peak starts to arrive at 1600 RPM. So that's, that's beautiful. Nought to 100 claimed in 6.3 seconds. So it's, it's quick. Um, I, I had some real thoughts about this car. Dynamically, it is brilliant. It is just everything you'd expect, in my opinion, of a GTI. It's performance, it's poise, the steering, the brakes, the seats, the, the whole driving experience. I really enjoyed it. And in my view, Volkswagen has fine-tuned the difference between the normal and sports setting. Um, in GTI's past, normal would be too economy-focused and sluggish, and sport would be too aggressive and, and in your face. They've got normal just right and sport is just right. In, in really, really good. Um, the minus, and I'm not normally hung up about this kind of stuff. There, there are screens in the car for the instruments and the multimedia stack, and they look very slick, but I found the multimedia frustrating to use. Um, yeah. Everything is slider controls, and it's hard to be accurate with it. It's almost... It's just not the safest way to go. We're using the nav, and it was terribly laggy and frustrating. So as you're driving, trying to operate these things, that's not good. And yeah. I'm, I'm also not a fan of the um, synthetic en enhancement of the engine and exhaust noise you, and, and all that. That's just a personal preference. But uh, the car is great to drive. But if you spend a bit of time with it and it started to interact with all of the, the screens and the way they work, it, I don't know, it would be borderline. I, I really didn't enjoy that aspect of the car. It's interesting. I'm slightly hamstrung because I only have only driven this generation GTI on the track. And so I haven't had a chance to drive it on the road to actually really experience what it's like. You know, certainly on yep. the track, I think it was better than the old car. Um, yeah. Yep. I think the old, the biggest issue I had with the old GTI was, I mean, kind of like the N3. It was very, it was very, again, like really good at a certain point. But other than that, like there's just so many gizmos and gadgets and things working behind the scenes that kind of suck the fun out of it and to me yeah. like a hot hatch should be simple like, yeah. it doesn't need to be mm. complex you know like it doesn't like oh i found the driving experience to be pretty much that that you right if you, okay. if you just hooked up with the power in, like in, the, in the in the eight gearbox gearbox the, was good oh i see i'm thinking in the seven i found the 7.5 was still oh, I get you. complicated yeah, but right. i think the eight on the track the uh -huh. initial experience was quite good i think they have okay. toned some of that down yeah um or just made it work better. You know, good but, technology is the technology you don't experience, right? The Golf GTI, it's like a pair of leggings. Like you get into them and they fit perfectly. Yeah. And that's that's like the Golf GTI. Leggings just, or jeggings? Uh, Richard, you've, which you've... I don't. I'll be honest. What are, the ones, with the, what are the ones with the stirrup? Uh, they're jeggings? So they... The <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know. Thank, <laughs> thankfully, I have no idea. Check, please. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so... Did, can you, anyone get the gesture control to work either? You know that uh, the... Oh, push, that's the, frustrating. Okay. That's part okay, of the push, frustration. Push, okay, push, there's another, push. there's there's just a podcast here and things that annoy Steve. <laughs> things but that don't work. Like, yeah, trying to operate a computer, like you say, um, you know, it, it's basically, that's what it is, right? It's a, it's a computer on the screen. It's so like a smartphone or a tablet or whatever you're trying to operate. Mm. And then like gesture control has got to be mm. one of the biggest wastes of time. I agree. In, in, in the, in recent history of the automobile. Like, yeah. like I remember driving the BMW gesture control where to like, 
turn the radio up or answer the phone. You have to like, you're like doing mm. this or you're like doing this yep. with the radio. It's That's like, crazy. You just have a, a, a scroll on the steer or a button on the steering wheel. You just do this. Or a little and dial. You, and you just you know, you don't even have to take your hands off the wheel. Why are you taking and your hands it, off the wheel to do jet It's a classic case of just because you can do something yeah. doesn't mean that you should. You've got it's to think hu- about the practicality. Yeah, that's that's it's my yes. It's 100%. That's what it is. That's all yeah. it is. It's like, yeah. this is great. And we can get rid of buttons. It's like. Yeah, I went to change those- the radio station. And as soon as my hand got a certain proximity to the screen, it went to some yes. other graphic about my distance to the car in front of me. So, yeah. Why yeah. people? You know. Yeah, frustrating. Like, was there a point where we would just where people were just like, oh, I hate all these buttons. Get rid of all these buttons. There's so many buttons in this car. I hate buttons. Buttons are like the worst thing in the world. I hate them. Get rid of them. No one, yeah. no one was like, no one cared. Everyone, everyone now misses the volume control because car companies like, let's make it look clean. It looks let's really sleek. Buttons. Showroom, showroom uh, appeal. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, minimizes. Maybe. Just, all right. Well, look, yeah. let's let's leave it there. That's our garage, and and let's move on to the feedback that we had from last week. And it was about Byron's story on the best worst sellers, cars that he considers worthy, that for whatever reason, aren't doing the business when it comes to the monthly registration numbers. Mm. And Lofty Vision said, interesting podcast again, fellas. Thank you, Lofty. Um, He says, am I the only one that thinks the Fiesta's ST Recaro seats are too small? He's 186 centimetres and about 90 kegs, and he couldn't squeeze in comfortably. Um, no. no wonder Ford didn't don't sell many. And he bear in mind he bought a GR Yaris, um, so he was trying various cars. And obviously on the road test, Richard, you're agreeing. Yeah, I put a yeah. hip out. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm 191 and, and 90 kilos, and seriously, I can't can't get into those seats. Like yeah. I've honestly, yeah, I, I it's what what type of person can yes. fit in those? I think yeah. we, weirdly aren't they bigger than the like? Don't remember the the old the previous. Focus ST was just like you kind of have to just yes, jam yourself like in that as well. Right. Right. Like I'm all, like a, I'm all for a bit of lateral support in a in a yeah. in a sporty car. But, but it was like, like a, a ride outside a ride outside of a supermarket. <laughs> but that's well, look, he also <laughs> ride outside of a supermarket. Anyway, he an was adult, also saying that an adult, he, yeah. Yeah. he yeah. considered yeah. the. I've just got a picture of <laughs> Richard's six foot three jammed into a Fred Flintstone <laughs> car. No you know, the Wiggles um, car. Of that for this <laughs> the Wiggles yeah, car. actually, you, I will. The, um, he also Sorry. said he considered the Clubman, uh, but he'd had a previously owned a JCW hatch. And he said uh, he didn't want to do the British bill quality BMW parts prices thing again. <laughs> yeah, <he'd>, uh, <laughs> All those taillights. Yeah, he said, I've, yeah. Learned, I've learned my lesson. But the one thing he did say was that a lot of people are turned off Euro cars and it was a recurring theme in, in the comments that we got. Yeah. It was resale, parts availability, and reliability. So that brought us on to Peugeot because there were a couple of Peugeots in Byron's list. Um, and Bill Katapotis, a regular correspondent, said he loved Byron's piece. Um, but again, he reiterated that it's Peugeot, it's about reliability, cost of parts, insurance, and resale. And I think resale is a bit of a killer for low-profile brands like Peugeot. And Richard, your old mate, DeCook, uh, tipped in and cool said... Case. Yeah, De Kulke, of course. Yeah. Um, he, he agreed that there's this um, cachet around German built and that gets you a certain resale value that, that some other brands don't. John Hewitt agreed. They make beautiful cars. Resale value is the thing. Um, Geo Bloke then chimed in and said, what about the Peugeot RCZ? I remember Whoa. reading that it was a great steer, but I'm not sure. I, I, I never saw one in real life. Just looking on it uh, online at it now, it looks amazing, even almost 10 years later. And I agree with him. The RCZ driving it in period, mm. it turned more heads than you could ever imagine. It was such a dramatic looking uh, little coupe. With a bubble top. It yeah, was, the double yeah, it was quick, bubble top. Very quick. But to, speak, speaking of expensive mm. parts, right? Like imagine if, you, imagine if you broke your rear windscreen. Or yes. your bubble top. Imagine, bub- the, imagine the, breaking your bubble top. Imagine you burst your bubble. Top and then the rear, <laughs> but even the rear window had the curves in it to, yes. to match the bubble top. Yes. So You're not like, going to get one of those out the back of Burke on your. Well, that's a great point. And it, it was it was such a, a lovely, dramatic looking car. But yes, goodness knows what your panel beater is going to make of the, uh, the parts price. <laughs> I've, I've made this bit flat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> John, I made this bit flat. Yes, I, it, is uh, kind of, it is kind of fascinating to me, like the way uh, the difference in perception between a Volkswagen and a Peugeot in this country. Yes, 
Yeah, because yeah, they're, they're they're direct rivals in Europe. They are split mm. by a border. You know, they are they are they border that's the, each that's other. the point that's that that's yet, the point to Cook made him, and he yeah. said that they're just runabouts um, yeah. in Europe. They're cheap runabout cars. Audi TT, um, RCZ. Yeah, and yeah. and now solidly built. So maybe maybe those concerns like, so are, are going the, away. I guess that's the interesting the question that still needs to be answered in terms of the reliability factor. And I, and I, you know, be interesting to get feedback from people who've, who've owned Peugeot's that like the current, yep. you know, the current breed, like the 308s and the 3008s of, that we've had the last five years. Are they how, they, how are they going five because years down the track? There's yeah. a perception. I think there's a, there's a perception issue, you mm. know, like, like I, mm. I have owned many old Alfa Romeos and I can say with some certainty <laughs> Yeah, I run reliable. That's a beautiful. Um, that's a beautiful segue. That's yeah. a beautiful segue, Steve. But um, we'll we'll hopefully get some feedback on on yeah. the Peugeots. That would be very interesting. But uh, De Kook, eh, um, okay. chimed in again because we were talking about Alfa Romeo in the context of Byron's story, and it was the Julia that that made the list. A good car, not selling well. Um, and De Kook says, "Great show again, guys. Thank you." Um, Alfa, the car I loved and hated the most. Uh, it drove me to the brand's official centenary in Milan and then kept breaking up for most of the same year. And it was where, he said it was where Marchione announced this grand plan to sell 100,000 alphas annually. And at that stage, based on Giulietta, Mito, Giulia, Stelvio, 8C and 4C. Um, then the launches kept getting postponed and the whole plan fell apart. And uh, so it's not only Australian market where they had grand ambitions. And I remember... Yeah, that centenary was 2010. Alpha was 100 years old in 2010. Harold Vester was CEO of Alpha, German guy. And at the reveal of the Alfieri concept, which was a Maserati concept at Geneva in 2014, I got the opportunity to sit down with uh, Lorenzo Ramachotti, who was the head of styling oh, name for, dropping. for the whole shebang. And he gave me a hint about this grand plan for all of FCA and Harold Vester was going to be at the, the top of it. And it was going to be fantastic for, for Alpha. And it went precisely nowhere. Mm. And Sergeant H Horvath, Sarge, um, says, I think the Alfa Romeo Giulia is low on sales because the brand needs the entry-level cars, a la Sud, Steve, or Mito, um, in order to give a path into the more expensive models. It's a bit like craft beer. New drinkers don't immediately like a double hopped IPA, <laughs> so you need to, you need to I, start on something a little less right. uh, intimidating. The, the, yeah, some I of mean, them are like eight percent, nine percent. You only you <laughs> need five, you only need five beers, and you're love right. Them. Yep, <laughs> um, all your troubles go away after one or two. Well, okay. So I mean, as much as I love a craft beer, Alfa Romeo is is a, is a is a car brand near and dear to my heart. My first car was an Alfa. I currently own an, a, the, a matching one, effectively. Um, yep. Uh, but I, like, 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 a, like. I mean, sorry. I guess to finish the point I made earlier is those cars were. We had our, we had a couple of our fetters and a sword and a one six four when I was when I was younger, and I thought it was perfectly normal to exchange Christmas gifts with your mechanic because you were there all the time. <laughs> they were like they were like extended family, like family friends. <laughs> Um, I'm sure like our mechanic when we were young, like they, they added a pool and a second story to their house based on some yes. of these cars. There's a picture of their boat on the wall yeah. Yeah. in the workshop. Um, <laughs> but but, but are the, are, is a Julia unreliable? You know, like I guess right. we're getting to the point where we're going to yeah. find out. Like this is, you know, they've been around now for like five years. It's yeah. now is the time where it's like, like if they're going to start falling apart, this is, this but, is really But the Steve, the, the perception is one thing. Yeah. It mm -hmm. takes so long. For the reality the to modify the perception. Yeah, and it this is where ages. I think Alpha in Australia especially missed it, missed an opportunity because I remember doing the launch for the Julia and saying to them, you're only doing a three-year warranty. Why? Mm. Why would you do that? And like, oh, we stand by these products. It's like, yeah, mm. but you have a reputation that is terrible. You've Your got to send a message. You have to say, we're going to do five years. We're going to do seven years. We're going to be mm. industry leading because because we trust them. It's a bit like saying... Yeah. Oh yeah, we oh these cars are great. We trust them completely. These are excellently built. We're not going to back them for more than three years because they'll probably fall apart. Because they may fall apart in four. The or flip five. side of that is we're not going to we're not worried about that because we know they're so infallible. Oh, they're so fine. Like it's mm. just like to me, you just have to you have to like put your money where your mouth is and say, listen, right. we are going to go above and beyond. Like they they could have had an industry leading warranty, like luxury market warranty at yeah. that point, right? They could have said five years or six years or whatever it was. Yeah. And get out there and, and and send a message that hey, this is why you should buy an Alpha mm. over a three series, over a C class. Well, that's yes. what Jeep did, didn't it? 
Well, Jeep came out because they were worried about their reputation. Well, you and know, they came out with that five-year warranty. That was the same launch. Yes. The same uh, launch. Yes, it was. It was Julia. About, this yep. is how fantastic yep. we're going to back these Jeep, yep. blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but you're not going to was, back yeah, the cars that have the terrible reputation. <laughs> like, you're just going to have this problem in, <laughs> in 10 years whenever no one wants to buy an Alpha. So, wow. yeah. I mean, as, but overall, as a brand, Alpha has, like, is there a more mismanaged car brand? Like, I mean, they just, like, at some point in the 90s, they, like, obviously just got rid of their product planning department because oh, they just didn't have any replacements. I was, just I was saying, just to reiterate but, something I mentioned last week, I have on three separate occasions heard the same spiel about Alpha. Mm. It's the rebirth. It's the renaissance. Yeah. It's the yeah. rebirth of Alpha. We're going to do 5,000 within the first five years, and then we'll kick on from there. We'll be challenging the likes of Volvo and Audi, and, and it just never happens. Do you know what I'm they need? Sure I'm going to hear it again. At some Alpha point. needs a Chinese company to come in and give it all the money in the world. Because Do you know the interesting it, thing was mm. when Piek was around and he yeah. was running VW Group, mm. he wanted to acquire Alfa Romeo. Now, there yeah. is a pretty magical kind now, of now, well, so yeah. this is the thing. This is the thing. As a, as a Alfa fanatic, Alfa Al- Fisti, whatever you want to call me, um, Steve, I, I hated that. I hated the idea of them becoming part of Volkswagen Group back then because I knew what would happen. They mm. would become re- yeah. Rebody, like if yeah, you drive, they would. Like, let's let's yeah, be honest. Okay. The Chinese Volkswagen, company wouldn't do that. But you drive a Volkswagen, they'd do or, witness Volvo. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? To be honest, I actually think I would, at this point I'd probably rather prefer Volkswagen took them over than something like yeah. a Chinese company, simply because I know the the track record of Volkswagen is pretty good. Like you look at what they're doing now with mm. the Seat and Cupra. It's Skoda. And like in, actually, the, in the in the rarefied air, they've let Lamborghini be Lamborghini. You can't. Look, they've, yeah. they've, you know, Germany, they've let things do. But I reckon, I reckon Germany, like a Germanic brand is the complete opposite to an Italian one. You'd lose yeah. all the art, the passion. The, well, but see, you know, the, but what do you say about like, like Cupra? It, it, they've, they've, they've allowed Cupra to be in Barcelona and have like yeah. still retain their Spanishness. Yep. Precisely. I remember, I remember like you, you mentioned Lamborghini. I remember a few years ago going on a tour of the factory. Mm, and it was quite interesting true. because it was, it was Italians in charge of the styling, yep. Italians in charge of manufacturing, like the, the labor force. And then Good point. The quality control was all German, mm. right? Yeah. That's where yeah. they are. That, it's, ma- it's, Audi- it's a potentially well, magical mix. Yeah. Well, you right? actually, well, actually, like I take back what I said. You're right. It just needs to be managed better. Yeah. yeah, that's it. But like, that's and it. like, the, if they're going electric, let's be honest, mm. they, and that's the path that 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 uh, Stellantis wants to take them now. Look, mm. hopefully, Stellantis can create the next failed Renaissance, but or they can actually actually revive Alfa Romeo as a brand. But yeah. they're mm. talking about going electric. To me, I would rather see like, you know, Alfa Romeos if they're going to build a you know, share platform. Hey, share it with a Taycan, you know, like a e- Audi e-tron yeah. GT, like. Yeah, I'm yep. not opposed to that. Like, if it's got Italian styling and it, like, because to me, that's what Alpha should be. Alpha should be the Italian version of BMW. All right. But, that's what those like. That's, yeah. that's Richard's point. I think it's a good one. It's management. And, yeah. and part of the wisdom of good management is knowing when to interfere and when yeah. not to. Yeah. And, and recognizing and trusting people yeah. um, in the roles they're in. So that's because that's, they've really that's done. The, it, exactly, Lamborghini is a perfect example where that yeah. car feels so Italian. Yeah, it does, right? yeah. But, but yeah. they've never been better. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, yeah. To like, your point with the, with the Chinese, the Chinese argument is like Geely and Volvo. Yeah. yeah. You know, Geely yeah, has it. allowed Volvo. Yeah. To retain as much Swedishness as exactly. they can, and yeah, and fed them a bit of money, yeah, a bit of like, investment. But yeah. you know, Tata has done that with with Land Rover and and I mean Jaguar mm. to a lesser degree, but I mean. Tata yeah. gave Jaguar the opportunity to bring back the F-Type as a sport, you know, yep. give them a proper sports car. Like, yeah, you know, but, and that was the thing. It was like, yeah, here is a pile of money. Mm. We're going to watch you make sure you don't blow all this money. Right. But, you know, you have a plan and we'll fund you to develop that plan and we'll see it through to fruition. We won't just like, yeah. like, you sound like, like my all, father, like already, <laughs> Alfred, like, <laughs> can I just Alfred have the keys, Mayer. dad? Can I just have the keys? <laughs> All right, look, we, we better Is move on. <laughs> we better move on. Um, quickly, Richard, uh, De Kulke has sent a, a question, more or less, your way. Yes. Uh, we were talking about sport packs or coupe SUVs or, you know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And he wonders whether the Renault Arcana is another overlooked car um, that should have been on Byron's list. Uh, what do you make of that? Do you think it's an underrated oh, uh, good car? or I, I Look, truth be told, I haven't driven it. Um, <laughs> there you go. But... Um, Look, it's it's you know it's got that again that coupe SUV is it an SUV is it not 
uh, styling. You know, it looks like a BMW GT X yes. Ben, you know, X sorry, X4 or something like that. I, um, <laughs> it might have gone better as a Mitsubishi, uh, yes. you know, uh, or in that, or you know, or a Nissan. Um, but um, look, being Renault and having enough trouble trying to sell cars in Australia as it is, and then coming out with something which is as polarizing that is like. Yeah, hiding something because that, that, that was part of uh, the cool case question. Should it yeah. have been maybe a Mitsubishi uh, or a Nissan rather than I, a, a I think I think it should have would have sold better as a Mitsubishi. I reckon. Yeah, yeah. Like, on, absolutely. You, honestly, you could call it a Mitsubishi Lancer because it it doesn't to me. It, it's it, oh, you know, this yeah, this this good blurred idea. this blurred line between coupe mm. and wagon SUV thing. Like it doesn't blur the line. It's a sedan. It's That's a, a great idea. Is it, is it too it's late a lift to pull back. It, the is Lancer it too late back. to yeah. recall the Arcanas and just make them into Lancers? I but think it just, it's a great idea. My thing is, it doesn't look like an SUV in any. No. Like apart from its height, yes, there is not a. It looks like a sedan because there's one that lives around the corner from me. All of a sudden, I pretty it has the branding on the side, so I'm pretty sure it's a dealer car as opposed to an actual sale. Right. Um, but it's a sedan. Let's just look at the silhouette of it. Again. That's a sedan. It's just jacked up. Like it, yeah. So it looks right. like, like the Ionic Five. Is that a is that a sedan or an SUV? That's a it's a big hatch. Big hatch. Big but this hatch. is like an oversized yes. hatch for for fifty percent bigger people. <laughs> but this kind of wraps up. This actually wraps up the whole conversation around wagons and all this yes. sort of stuff. You know, yep. people people don't buy wagons mm. except we love them and we buy tens of thousands of them. We just call them SUVs. That's all an yes, SUV is. Is yes, a jacked up point. wagon, a high right? riding wagon. I know Good people point. that are yeah. like, oh, I would never buy a wagon. Wagons are terrible. They're ugly and I yeah. hate them. I want to buy an SUV though. Guess what? It is a <laughs> yeah. wagon. You've got like, one. Yeah. You know, like, that's like, that's All that's right. What now, look, we, we, we better move on. The last okay. comment is almost like a moment in time. It's a marker. And our good mate, Hammer Rocks, hey! has, has called out the fact he actually says another brilliant episode, gents, with a thumbs up. So thank you, Hammer. Um, he was gobsmacked to read that Tesla Model 3 was the best-selling car in Europe in September. Um, yeah. And not just electric, best-selling car full stop. And on, um, and on track to outsell Camry this year too. And one thing I would say, that Tesla deliveries tend to fluctuate um, yeah. a, a fair bit. So maybe it was an odd month anyway. And Hammer makes the point. We'll, it'll be interesting to see if they can back it up. But the market in Europe for September dropped 25% year on year, September to September. That's mm. partly to do with, you know, microchip shortages and what have you. But battery electric and plug-in hybrid was up 42%. So in terms of their share of that market, massively increased. And diesel's in a death spiral. It was down 18% um, in terms of its market share. So mm. seismic shifts happening as yeah. we speak. So yeah. the next uh, the next few months will be really interesting to see what happens in Europe. It's, it's um yeah. It's a it's a moment in time. So. <laughs> yeah, I I think the thing is, and I, I can't remember if we mentioned it on here before or not, but I just think there is a there's been a like a, a cultural shift, right? There's a cultural shift towards, you know, there look, you know, not to get political and because there's arguments and people will get you know mad about it, but like I think I think a vast amount of the population has acknowledged climate change is a significant issue to them personally. And want to make a change, right. and I think that's why. And and the, at the bottom line is that's what drives companies to do things. Mm. Like, like what, Volks, what are they going to sell? Like yeah. car companies aren't going to make it electric because they really care about the environment. They will make the cars that they people want to buy. Now, obviously, they're being legislated because politicians know that that's how they get votes because that's how people are voting. Yeah. People yeah. are voting because of the you know because yeah. of their their beliefs. Yeah. Around the, around the environment, so it, it's all this knock on effect, but it's all driven ultimately by consumer. It's it's, it's part consumer of the preference. reason why you can have the dichotomy in in the world of Chevrolet, where they're selling an e crate motor, electric yeah. motor, and they're yeah. selling one of the most humongous V8s known to mankind as a crate engine as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as long as they're able to, they'll satisfy demand in any part of the market. Yeah. You know, if yeah. they're legislated out of it, so be it. But there will be a demand for different things. At different times. Yeah, and you you watch like companies like Ford and and like you know Ford of Europe have said we're going to go all electric. Ford the US has not made a commitment to be all electric by X yeah. date yeah. because mm -hmm. they know they can still sell a ton of like um, F one fifties and Mustangs and yeah. and one even Ford beyond that, is history. crate motors. <laughs> like yeah, so 
they will go where the market goes. And I, but I think that's interesting that Europe, the European market has made that shift. You know, I think Australia's probably yeah. a little bit further behind. But yeah, I think I look, we're sort of like halfway in between, you know, the yeah. US and, and Europe. But, you know, because we source so many of our cars like through Europe, I think we'll be forced to go electric before the United States. It'll, oh, be, yeah. be, it'll, be, it'll be them kicking and screaming all the way to the finish line. I reckon. They'll be rolling coal in Tesla charging points. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It'll be the, the next <laughs> flash point. <laughs> but look, I think with that, for episode number 208 of the Cars Guide podcast, we have reached the finish line. And uh, it's time to say thank you, Richard. Thank you. And thank you, Steve. Thanks, mate. And thanks to our science Viking, beardsman, and yo-yo grandmaster, Mr. Pritchard, for keeping his eyes on the podcast production prize. Uh, Today, he's wearing a T-shirt reading, free hugs. Just kidding. Don't touch me. Um, (laughs) Elf shorts and gold high tops with LED daytime running lights. Extraordinary. Uh, Jump into the conversation. Cars Guide is on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Apple Podcast listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Five is the preferred uh, number of stars. Thank you. Um, If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, look, if you've got customizable nav... Don't do as I did and drop in Bono's voice because the streets have no name and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs>